Good morning, Gillsburg. It is good to see everyone this morning. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. If you would, please pull out your bulletin as well as pay attention to the screens on either side, and we'll go through some quick announcements for you uh, this morning. I want to remind everyone about our Wednesday night services. A Wednesday night will begin at 6 o'clock. We have GAs, RAs, Mission Friends, and Youth, as well as a nursery, and the adults have their prayer meeting at 6 o'clock Wednesday night, so we please invite you to come to that uh, if you are not used to. I want to, uh, again, promote our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our 2020 goal was 3500 We are close, but no cigar. So please continue to pray and continue to meditate on that. And if you feel led to give uh, to the Lottie Moon, you can do so here in the service on Sunday mornings, or you can give online as well. So I want to remind you about that. Gillsburg Grub is on Tuesdays. Uh, they could use some help uh, preparing the boxes or delivering or even if you just feel uh, like giving to that cause, they'll use your money uh, to help buy that food. So please remember uh, Gillsburg Grub and reach out to Miss LaWanda or Brother Vic if you are interested in that. I want to let everyone know the women on missions are collecting socks. They're collecting socks to donate to nursing homes. If you could buy a pack of socks and bring it and put it in the foyer in that box, they would greatly appreciate that, and we appreciate that group uh, for doing such a thing. And then also, on Feb Friday, February the 26th, Friday, February the 26th, we'll have a benefit for Mr. Joey Wall. It'll last from 11 to 2. We'll be selling pulled pork dinners. They're $10 a plate, $10 a plate, and you need to see Mr. Jeffrey Wall for tickets. So if you need a ticket, uh, please see Mr. Jeffrey Wall, February the 26th, 11 to 2, and they're $10 each. I believe that's all the announcements I have this morning. Anything I need to add from anyone out there? If not, I got one for you. Kind of wake you up. Feel like I'm at a funeral. <clears throat> there was this young married couple who finally tied the knot, and they had their first argument. The argument was over who should fix the coffee each morning. And the wife said, I promise you it's in the Bible the husband should fix the coffee each morning. And the husband's like, oh my God, show me in the Bible where I'm supposed to fix the coffee each morning. So she pulled it out and she said, Hebrews. Thank you for being here. Brother Doug, it's all yours. Think about it, think about it. The psalmist says in Psalms 30, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. I'm so glad he lifted me. Let's stand and say amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you now to thank you for each and everything that you do for us, Lord. Just thank you for the ability to be able to come here and worship you the way that we do. Lord, just thank you for these that were able to come out this morning. And Lord, just ask you to be with the ones that could be here for whatever reason, Lord. Especially lift up the ones on our prayer list, Lord, that's needing your healing hand. 
Lord, just ask you to be with Brother Vic as he brings your message this morning. Lord, just pray that someone needs to come to know you, Lord, that they would do so this morning. Lord, we ask you to lead God and direct us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, my little Gillsburg buddies, come on down. In case anybody's wondering what's going on with my lip, I got between Mr. Tommy and dessert, so. No, it's a skin cancer, and the uh, doctor had to burn it off. And to all you young people, watch that sun. This is what you wind up looking like. Austin. We're going to be in a funeral parlor before long. Okay, today we're going to make chocolate chip cookies. We're going to make great chocolate chip cookies. But we're also going to we'll tell you how to make great coffee chip cookies, but I also am going to tell you how to make a great church. Now, the first thing we need for chocolate chip cookies is sugar. So we're going to put some sugar in there. And the first thing we need for a great church is great preachers like Brother Vic and Brother Austin. The next thing for our chocolate chip cookies, we're going to put in some flour. And the next thing we need to make a great church is Mr. Doug and Miss Carolyn and Miss Cecilia to play us beautiful music. Then we're going to put in some Crisco for our chocolate chip cookies. And that's going to be for our Sunday school teachers and our GA teachers and our RA leaders for them to make a good church. So we've got good preachers, we've got good song people, we've got good Sunday school and GA and RA and mission friends leaders. Then we're going to add some milk to make our chocolate chip cookies. Great chocolate chip cookies. Then in order to make the church great, you know what else we need? We need all these people in here to, be, to come to church. Now, we've got everything in here to make great chocolate chip cookies, don't we? Isn't there any? Everything's in here to make chocolate chip cookies? What? We forgot the chocolate chip, so how can we have great chocolate chip cookies? So, we're going to put chocolate chips in our chocolate chip cookies. Now we've got great chocolate chip cookies, don't we? We've got the preachers, we've got the song leaders, we've got the Sunday school teachers, we've got you and me. What did I leave out to make a great church? We have the people. What did I leave out for us to have a great church? A piano. We got Miss Carolyn playing the piano. Who did we leave out? If who's not here, how can we not have a great church if who's not here? God. Jesus and God. So if we don't put chocolate chips in chocolate chip cookies, they won't be chocolate chip cookies, would they? And even if we have the best preacher and the best song people and the best people to come to church, if we don't let God and Jesus come into this house with us and worship him, we won't have a very good church at all, will we? We'd, we could just go out to the lake or to the pond and swim without taking Jesus, couldn't we? So let's remember, when we enter these doors of this church, we are here to worship Jesus and God. We are here to learn about him. We are here to worship him. We're here to pray with him. And we're here to know in our hearts that he is here with us. So don't remember, don't ever leave the chocolate chips out of the cookies. And don't ever leave Jesus out of your heart in church, okay? All right, I got you some chocolate chip cookies made. Miss Presley and Connor is going to give them to you when y'all go back, okay? I saw our prayer lady today is Miss Layla. Dear God, thank you for this day. Please help everybody to know God in Jesus' name. Pray, amen. Good job. Jesus John Davis. John Davis. loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. In Psalm 40, he says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit and set my feet on the rock. And in 1 John, he says, God showed his love among us. He sent his only son. Let's sing about that love. Let's stand for singing. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, walking the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with sin. 
singing to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me.
psalmist said, he lifted me out of the slimy pits of sin. He touched me. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me Blessed Savior, says He cleansed and made me whole. I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while He turns. Touch me, oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and Amen and amen. All God's people said amen. Thank you, Brother Doug and Carolyn, for that great, great classic song. Just doesn't get any better than that, does it? Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, and I trust that you do, turn with me to the second chapter of the book of Acts today. Acts chapter 2. And in a moment, we'll begin reading there in about verse 32. Um which you're going to have to go back and do a little reading on your own to kind of pull this all together um, later on because I'm kind of starting at a necessary point due to time. A couple of weeks ago at the beginning of this year, we began a brief series of messages. We began talking about when the church, we first talked about to begin our year when the church prays, when the church praise and we we had several things to say about the praying church and based on the book of Acts and others and then we talked about when the church worships when the church worships and uh, we talked about our worship now I want to carry that one step further today and I want to talk to you about when the church witnesses when the church witnesses. Acts chapter 2 gives to us one of the best snapshots, if you will, of the early church. We obviously don't have a, a total historical account of every service and um, really don't have an account of very many services, but we do know some basic things. We do know some things 
that Dr. Luke records for us in the book of Acts, and those things give to us great pause in our thinking about uh, what that early church did and what they were able to do and what we uh, perhaps may need to do today. We may need to take a fresh look at, especially in the beginning of this new year. So beginning at this rather awkward spot here uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this is actually in the middle of the sermon that Peter was preaching. And in the middle of his sermon, verse 32, where we're starting, uh, he says this, God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father that promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? And Peter continued his sermon. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need every day. They devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Father, thank you for this masterless passage of Scripture, for that which it teaches us, for its instructive power. And for the capacity that it has to lead us and guide us and direct us as a church. And so we pray in these moments that we might let these words penetrate in our hearts and through the work of your spirit in our lives change us here. We leave this place. May things of eternal significance occur in these moments. Keep us safe. In the matchless name of Christ, we do pray. Amen. Think for a minute that we are entering a courtroom and you or I are going to be a witness. As a witness there, there are certain parameters that we must stay within. First of all, we do one thing. Every witness swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Additionally, there are some comments that will bring a swift response from the opposing counsel if you're a witness. If you are a witness and you say, I think so-and-so, the opposing counsel will say, objection, and it will be sustained on the grounds that that is speculation. As a witness, the court is not interested in what you think. You may say, I wished so-and-so. And again, the opposing counsel, objection, Your Honor, that's imagination. We don't deal in imagination in the court. We deal in facts. We deal in the truth. 
You may say someone told me in your testimony, objection, Your Honor. That's not admissible testimony. That's hearsay. We want to know what you know as a witness. We want to know what you saw as a witness. Only that is admissible in court, which is factual according to you and according to what you know to be the truth. You have sworn by your testimony that that's what it will be. I think that you and I need to, to think about that in terms of our relationship to Christ based on this passage of Scripture because that's what a Christian witness must do also. It is not what I think. It is not what I wish. It is what is the fact. What has Jesus done for you and me? When the church witnesses only that is admissible, which God has, has done for us, very simply, Dr. D.T. Niles, a great Selenese Methodist preacher from another era. Dr. Niles put it very simply this way. He was for more than 30 years the most uh, authoritative Christian voice in, in all of Asia. And he said, a witness for Christ is simply one beggar telling another where to find bread. That's what we do. That's what happens when the, when the church witnesses. Dr. Vance Havner says, we don't have a secret to be hidden, but we have a story to be heralded. We don't come to church to hear the gospel. We go to church from church to share the gospel. Maybe the best one is this. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I want you to see what this passage tells us again. I want to see maybe some things as I read it and reread it again. There were some things that, that came to me that I found in my search that, that I had never seen before about this passage, and I want to see if I can share them with this moment. What happens when the church witnesses look at another aspect or two of this early church that we read about here first of all when the church witnesses there is a witness a witness of fellowship look again at verse 42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. That term may better be translated loving fellowship. Loving fellowship. The believers were still meeting at some times in the temple. They were still using the, the temple as, as a meeting place. But they also met in their homes uh, oftentimes as well. Verse 46 tells us every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread from house to house. So they were using both places there. They met together. Some translation says they were being together. They met in the temple. They met in their homes. Why did they do that? They had a lot to do. Did you hear the number that they quoted there a moment ago? There were 3,000 souls that were added in that one day. There was much work to do. Many of those people needed instruction. They were coming out of pagan backgrounds. They were coming uh, out of Judaism. They were coming out of the, the jots and the tittles of the scribes and the Pharisees. There was plenty, plenty, plenty of work for them to do. And this church was committed. To the fellowship, they were not only making converts, but they were making disciples. They were working at it every day. And the scripture says they devoted themselves to, to breaking bread. Now, I think it is altogether appropriate for us to say that they were eating together. They were fellowshipping around the table. They were having their meals together oftentimes. But here's an interesting thing. 
they were probably also closing every meal with the Lord's Supper. Bread and wine was a common element on the Jewish table. It was always there. It was there, and so when they got through with their meal, whatever their meal was, they took the bread and they took the wine and they distributed it as they had been instructed, and they just observed the Lord's Supper before they got through. Isn't that great? I mean, I, I read that, and it just sort of blew me away. I hadn't ever, I don't remember reading that before. At the end of each meal, they made the end of that meal a memorial to Christ. This do in remembrance of me. And regularly they were fellowshipping together and remembering by observing the Lord's Supper, this memorial to Christ. The scripture says prayers and wonders and signs were occurring. And additionally in verse 44, it says that they held all things in common. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. They were fellowshipping. This witness of fellowship was working. Now, don't get off in a weed patch somewhere and say, oh, well, these were just early communists. That's not true. This is not a form of communism or socialism. It is simply this. It is a reference to their intense ability and desire to share the material goods that God had blessed them with. They didn't just pool everything and then some dictator decide that you get this and you get this and you get that. That's not what happened. That's not what's going on here. What they did was totally voluntary. What they did was also temporary. What they did was primarily motivated by love. It is not and was not and never has been communism. Their fellowship and the way that they were handling the very day-to-day -day goods that God had blessed them with was attracting people in a mighty way. Here, 3,000, if you read another account, there's another account a little bit later on where 5,000 or 4,000. They had more people coming than they knew what to do with. And they were doing the best that they could. All the believers were together and held all things in common. You see, that's what's characteristic of the witness of Christian fellowship. They were voluntarily sharing everything sacrificially in love. They were binding themselves one to the other. That's what we want to do. That's what we need to do as the, as the fellowship of believers, the body of Christ, the Gillsburg Baptist Church, the witness of fellowship ought to be a hallmark because this early church was that way. Yes, that's a good reason for us, but because it honors Christ, because it honors Christ. Now, the second thing is this. Not only did this church have a witness of fellowship in a, in a mighty way, but they had a witness of service. A witness of service. Material needs or, or real needs. Missionaries have, have long told us, I, I've heard this ever since I was a, a child and heard my first missionary speak in the Baptist church. Missionaries have, have long told us that it is impossible to go to, to the mission field and to witness to someone about the love of Jesus if they are hungry and they haven't eaten in, in days. They say it is next to impossible to win someone to Christ who is thirsty and hasn't had a, a drink of clean water to the point that they are, they are suffering from the fact they haven't had water. They say that it's almost impossible to share the gospel with someone who has great medical needs or someone who is in pain or someone who is cold or someone who doesn't have any shelter from the heat or from the rain or from the cold or whatever it might be. You see, someone who is in pain needs pain relief. Someone who is sick needs medication. Someone who is hungry needs a meal. Someone who is thirsty needs a drink of cold water. And Jesus himself said, if you just give a cup of cold water 
in my name. It honors me. Material needs are real needs. And everything is futile until we can meet those needs in some cases. This is not communism. The early Christians weren't communists. They were servants. And they held everything in common so that they could provide service. The scripture is replete with examples also about our Lord Christ who did the same thing. The gospels bear testimony of that particularly in the book of Mark. The book of Mark tells us that Jesus ate with sinners. How dare he? He ate with tax collectors. The scribes and the Pharisees called him out about it. They said, look at him. Look at what he's doing. They took him to task. And Jesus just kept right on going. He evangelized by loving and by serving and by telling as he went along the way. That's the example. Material needs are, are real needs. But meeting those material needs opens doors. Meeting material needs open doors. Do you remember what else Jesus did? He washed the disciples' feet. And he set that example. He told us to give that cup of cold water or whatever it might be, cold water or hot soup or whatever is applicable. I read an interesting story. It came from the state of Texas out of the one, one of the big mega churches out there about a lady who presented herself to that church as a candidate for baptism. She had trusted Christ as her Savior. And uh, they were doing a, a pre-baptismal interview with her, just making sure that everything was in order and talking with her briefly. And one of the pastors asked her why she trusted Christ. And she told him this story. She was a, a woman, a Hispanic woman of, of means and of culture and of education and of refinement, but she had been forced to come to the United States. She was alone in that big metropolitan area. She didn't know anyone. And a, a lady from the church found out about her and went to visit her. And they became friends as, as she visited. They, they developed a relationship, and at Christmas time, the lady from the church took her a Bible, beautifully wrapped. It was written in her own language. She didn't speak much English. And she took her a Bible that was beautifully wrapped, written in her language, and, and gave it to her as a Christmas gift. And then, and then, the lady from the church invited the lady to come to her home and share a meal. And the lady said, the present was fine. But she said, it was after she invited me to come and share a meal that I knew that the story in the book about God's love was true. And she came to Christ because of that witness. Meeting needs opens doors. Several weeks ago, we began serving lunch on Tuesday to many of our shut-ins who have been confined due to the pandemic and others who are confined because of physical ailments and a lot of different things. We're about up to somewhere between 45 and 50, depending on the week. Several of you have been there. And I've heard this story so many times. And having experienced it myself, I know it's true. But so many who have come and worked and prepared a box, and particularly those of you who have gone out and knocked on a door, it's hard for folks to be angry with you when you bring a hot lunch to them, right? <laughs> I've heard over and over again, I got more blessing out of this today than anything 
I've ever done. I've heard that story over and over again. I've experienced it myself. Just a, a simple meal. These, weren't, these are not elaborate meals. We try to get it there as quick as we can and right around lunchtime we try to keep it hot and we try to make it good. But over and over again, I think they enjoyed my visit more than they did the meal. And that's probably true in some cases. Over and over again. They were so glad to see me. They were, they were sitting at the table waiting for me to get there, waiting for me to come. The gift fellowship, the witness of fellowship, the witness of service. I challenge you. Somebody say, oh, I can't come on Tuesday, I work. Just take off one day, just one, and come and prepare some boxes or whatever. There's always something for somebody to do. Yeah, Brother Walter and Brother Tommy and somebody cook. And leave there and tell me you weren't blessed. And I won't ever say anything to you again. I'll shut up. I'll go on. Or go on one of these routes and go knock on a door and say, here's your lunch. And look at that smile. And we haven't been hugging too much, but some of them you don't get away from. You get a hug anyway. It don't make any difference what we're supposed to be elbow bumping, you know. Just, just experience that. The witness of service. That's what the early church was doing. And that's what Jesus has commanded us to do. But thirdly, this passage talks about not only the witness of fellowship and the witness of service, but it talks about the witness of proclamation. The witness of, of proclamation. They faithfully proclaimed the word of God. Now, here's your, here's your assignment. In, in Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon begins in verse 14. So you to go back and, and you have an opportunity to read this entire passage from verse 14 all the way to nearly the end, about down to verse 36. That's, that's Peter's sermon in its entirety. And look at what he had to say. Now, it's a little different from our sermons today. It, you know, every sermon is a little bit different. Everybody has a little different take on what to do and how to do it. But you'll see that all of the essential elements were there. There was this faithful delivery. He, he had some Old Testament prophecy in there. He had some, uh, some verses about God's gift of his son and how much he loved us and how Jesus was died and was buried and he rose again and the curse of sin. And he said to them, repentance is necessary. Repent, every one of you, in his name and be baptized. It was a powerful message. And he closed it out with verse 40 that we said there in the emphasis, here is mine, and with many other words. So we don't have the entire text of his sermon but this is the, the gist of it and with many other words he testified and strongly urged them in a phrase saying be saved from this corrupt generation and you see that still preaches today that's still necessary today that's the essential nature of the proclamation that we do as the church of the living God it is an essential part of our witness to continually bear that message that God has given to us be saved today be saved from this corrupt generation so as you read that sermon, read it on your own and read it in its entirety so you get the, the entire context of what Peter had to say because I started in the middle of it. But there is a verbal witness that is necessary. The witnessing church has this essential witness of, of proclamation that we do at stated times on Sunday and on Wednesday evening. But we also are required we are required to proclaim a verbal witness as we are going. As we are going about our business every day, wherever it is we are, whatever it is we're doing. I, I hear sometimes, and, and I do it, but we pray, Lord, Lord, make me a better Christian. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. All of us need to be, but in reality... Our prayer ought to be this, Lord, make me a bold Christian. Lord, make me a bold verbal witness that I may speak and that I may act and may share. 
Because that's what he has called us to do. As the church of the living God, the witness of proclamation is essential from this pulpit every time one of us stands here to preach. But it is even more essential when we leave this place and bear that verbal witness. If all of the emphasis is upon me and you being better, then we may take the focus off of Christ and put it more on us we run that risk too much me and too little Christ that's why my verbal witness that was not what they did if you read this passage in its entirety in the book of Acts this going growing witnessing church there weren't content with just once a week service as usual print the bulletin and meet together the scripture says they met daily They cared daily. They shared daily. They searched the scripture daily. They won souls daily. And they were increasing in number daily. Now that's a going, growing church. You see, church wasn't just a once a week routine for them. That wasn't good enough. They made it not a once a week routine but a day-to-day reality. And that's what we need to seek as we look toward a new year. Not a -a once-a-week routine, but a day-to-day reality. I read a fascinating story recently. Dr. R.A. Torrey will will always be in one of the the great names in evangelism in this country. Dr. Torrey lived in the late 1800s, early, early 1900s. He was a theologian and a scholar and a, and a writer. He's one of those guys that could write little short things and a, and a little short paragraph of his about that long. You had to read it about four or five times before you really get exactly what he said. His thinking is so far beyond mine. But I love to read what he said. But I, I read something from his personal experience in one of his books about prayer. And Dr. Torrey, who was the the second president of the great Moody Bible College in Chicago, Dr. Torrey wrote this. He, He said, I waited and watched 15 long years to get to speak to one man Never a day passed in all of those 15 years that I did not speak to God in prayer about that man. At last, my chance came. And in that one encounter, it was my privilege to lead him to Christ. I thought, who am I meeting at some point in the future that I've been that concerned about? Who am I praying for on a daily basis? Who am I waiting to meet That one time to be able to lead them to Christ, the gospel, is not something that we come to church to hear. It is something we go from church to tell. And you and I, if we are the kind of witnesses that God has vested in us to be are just nobodies telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's what happens when the church witnesses. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you again for the witness of this passage. 
And now in invitation time, I pray that our hearts and souls may have been stirred by the reality of these words. By the reality of this working, witnessing church. And how I pray that, that all of us might see ourselves in the light of that church, but more importantly in the light of what you called us to do in this new year in 2021. There are those things that are swirling all about us, Father that would distract us, that would cause us to become depressed and discouraged. There are that, those things that are, that are occurring all about us that would say to us, just quit. Just don't go back. Just stop. But that's, that's not what you've said. That's not who we are. That's not what you've called us to do and to be. And so I pray in, in this moment that all of us might catch a glimpse of these people at work so long ago with so many other difficulties, so many needs to meet and limited resources in comparison to what all of us enjoy and help us to leave this place this morning committed that fellowship and service and witness will be the hallmark of who we are as the Gillsburg Baptist Church scattered into this community love and to serve and to be a part to be together help us to be a witness to those that we contact and be aware that we are and by the way that we live and the way that we act the way that we speak may we bear not only that essential witness but the verbal witness that you have called us to do bless we pray in this invitation time if there's one here who knows you not in the pardon and forgiveness of sin may that soul trust you today and make that decision public. Young person, boy, girl, middle-aged person, or senior adult makes no difference. All of us need to repent and be saved from this corrupt generation. So I pray that someone might follow the clarion call of the Holy Spirit of God, which says, Come unto me, all ye who labor, and I will give you rest. Bring peace to some soul today, dear Father. Maybe there's someone here who would come on transfer of a letter in any other way that we receive members as the Gillsburg Baptist Church. Bless this invitation. It belongs to you. It is totally yours. Remove us completely, and may your perfect will be done in every heart and life. Here we pray in the matchless name of Christ. Stand quietly to your feet, and we'll sing together a couple of verses of without him. And as we do, if God is speaking to your heart, would you come this morning? Would you come? Brother Doug, lead us as we sing. You need to come to Christ. Just step out and come on right now. If you've never publicly put your trust in him, would you come today? Would you bear that kind of witness and then go from this place to witness for him all the days of your life? Would you come this morning? Come just now. Come on, young person, teenager, boy, girl, one of our children, maybe. Oh, would you come today? God is speaking to your heart. Would you come just now? sing just one final stanza God is speaking he's dealing with you now there's an opportunity to come would you come maybe you need to come to this altar and pray for a moment it's always open so would you just come share your heart with him would you come now
thank you so much. Thank you for your kind attention and your presence here today. God bless you for your faithfulness. Brother Walter's got the doors open back there. Remember, we kind of stagger ourselves as we go out so that we don't gang up. We're still dealing with the effects of this pandemic, so be aware of that. Our ladies can ease on out now and head back to the nursery. If you need to go back that way, you head on out early. And um, we'll not gang up at the door back there. Get your mask out and get your mask on and let's protect one another. We've done pretty well so far, so let's continue to do that. And we just continue to pray that better days are ahead. Pray for those who are ill. We do see some encouraging signs in the reports that are coming out. Vaccine is more available. And uh, I think we're supposed to get a new load tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so be aware of that and get yours as soon as you possibly can. Let's go away rejoicing. Brother Doug, how about dismissing us today, please, sir? Father, God, we just thank you for the opportunity we can just get up this morning, Lord, and just be there that you gave us. Lord, we come here to your house and worship together. We thank you for the time we have spent in Bible study this morning. We thank you for the time that we can sing praises to you about your love for us and our love for you. Lord, we thank you for this message that Brother Vic has pulled from his heart this morning, Lord, and just help us to be responsive to that message in a way to be pleasing to you, that every day and everywhere we go, we will be a witness and people will see us as your child. Lord, we just actually ask again you to bless these that couldn't come today, whatever the reason might be, whether it be uh, sickness or whether it be grieving or, Lord, just plain unconcerned. Lord, we just lift all these up to you now that they might return to your house. Dismiss us now with your love and go with us through this week and let us be that shining light that we need to be for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.